hearing is fully virtual this morning, so we do have a few housekeeping matters. Um, uh, for today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. Uh, if I notice when you are recognized that you haven't unmuted yourself, I will ask the staff to send you a request to unmute yourself. Please then accept that request so you are no, um, so you are no longer muted. Um, I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that your time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member, then members who are present at the time the hearing is called to order. They will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, house rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. My gosh, there's so many rules and regulations here. So as we, as we, as we move forward. Um, so that I really wanna welcome everyone this morning and I want to acknowledge ranking member Cole uh, and all of, of, of my colleagues for joining. And a particular thank you uh, to our witnesses for testifying, very, very excited about uh, all of you this morning. Dr. Pamela Cantor, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, uh, Mr. Max Eden, and Dr. Timothy Schreiber. I will provide a more a fulsome introduction before their testimony, but so delighted that you could all join us this morning for this hearing. Um, American author, social critic, and educator, Neil Postman, once said, and I quote, children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. They are quite literally the legacy we leave behind, uh, that legacy that we behind us, and the surety that everything we do continues onward, making the world a better place when we are gone. Which is why it's not only incumbent on parents and educators to ensure our nation's children are primed to meet the challenges of the future, it is also incumbent on all of us, especially legislators, to ensure they are sufficiently prepared, not only intellectually, but emotionally and socially as well. Decades of adolescent development research have shown that all aspects of a child's well being must be supported if we are to ensure their success. The Learning Policy Institute, which states that, and I quote, a whole child approach to education is premised on the fact that children's learning depends on a combination of instructional, relational, and environmental factors the child experiences, along with the cognitive, social, and emotional uh, processes that influence one another as they shape the child's growth and development." End quote. Fortunately, there are a variety of strategies that instructional and school leaders can employ to support the whole child, including social and emotional learning interventions. The evidence base behind these interventions is overwhelming. High quality SEL programs that support students' social, emotional, and cognitive development result in lasting positive academic and life outcomes. Four meta-analyses conducted by CASEL and researchers over the past decade found that students participating in SEL programs show sig significantly more positive outcomes related to academic performance and positive behavior. A 2021 evidence review by the Early Intervention Foundation found that SEL interventions are effective at enhancing students' social and emotional skills while reducing symptoms of depression and anxiety. And RAND Corporation found that there are at least 60 SEL interventions that have been evaluated that meet the evidence requirements for the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, the Elementary and Secondary Education Law reauthorized in 2015. In fact, the evidence in support of these interventions is so strong that a 2015 bipartisan report from American Enterprise Institute and Brookings concluded that, and I quote, the federal government should provide resources 
for state and local education authorities to implement and scale evidence-based social emotional learning practices and policies, end quote. I could not agree more. For too long, education policymakers at the federal level have been slow to focus necessary attention and resources on approaches that adequately address the holistic needs of students to drive stronger achievement in school and beyond. And in light of the extreme stress and hardship our country's most vulnerable students have faced during the COVID-19 pandemic, these effective strategies are needed more than ever, which is why in the first year of chairing this subcommittee uh, in fiscal year 2020, uh, we created an initiative in the Labor H Bill on SEL and whole child approaches in K through 12 education. Um, in the recently passed bipartisan fiscal uh, year 2022 omnibus appropriations package, this includes $82 million for evidence-based field initiated SEL grants that address student social, emotional, and cognitive needs within the Education Innovation and Research Program. It includes $85 million for the Supporting Effective Educator Development Program of the Priority for Professional Development and Pathways into Teaching and School Leadership that provide a strong foundation in implementing SEL and the whole, whole child strategies. And further, $100 million is set aside for school-based mental health professionals grants to help local education agencies directly increase the number of mental health professionals in schools. And finally, there is $75 million for full service community schools, providing comprehensive services and expanding evidence-based models that meet the holistic needs of children, families, and communities. The subcommittee's work is direct response to what has been recommended strategies and approaches that are championed by our witnesses today and was significantly influenced by the landmark National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development Report. Um, we started from nearly zero uh, for these SEL and whole child programs just a couple of years ago. And we now have secured resources, uh, which have been, as I said, long time in coming. And I am so pleased to have been able to work with Ranking Member Cole, my colleagues in the House and Senate, to be able to get this done. And so many of the um, uh, uh, efforts about promoting uh, social and emotional learning has come from members of this, of this subcommittee. Appropriations legislation requires negotiation and agreement from both parties and chambers of Congress. So I am proud that our bipartisan legislation has included the SEL uh, and whole child approaches initiative for the past three years. Um, the initiative was inspired by Dr. James Comer, a psychiatrist at Yale Child Study Center, who worked with New Haven Public Schools starting in 1968. His model for child learning demonstrates focusing on positive school environments and students' social and emotional needs is necessary to promote their cognitive development and academic success. I hope that in this hearing today, we can learn more about the overwhelming body of evidence in support of these programs and that the federal support that is needed. Um, especially eager to ask our witnesses where it is that we need to go and where the resources are best used. But before we turn uh, to our, our witnesses, let me yield uh, to my uh, a colleague, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Congressman Cole, for any opening remarks that he may have. Congressman Thank Cole. You. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, just for the purposes of housekeeping, before I get into my prepared remarks, I need to let you and the committee know I have to leave by about 11 or a little before we have a rules committee meeting so we can get some stuff on the floor and hopefully uh, get home uh, reasonably uh, at a reasonable time this week. So I'm, I'm sure you would rather me be there than here anyway. So uh, again, good morning, uh, members of the subcommittee and uh, certainly to our testifying witnesses. I wanna thank you for being here today and look forward to, as always to our discussion. I'll admit up front that I don't know a great deal about the topic being discussed today. From what I've learned, social and emotional learning is a curriculum or teaching methodology that's intended to help students to better comprehend uh, their emotions and demonstrate empathy for others. That sounds like a, a good thing indeed. Uh, but I, am all, I also have uh, concerns as to whether or not the federal government uh, or this committee has any role to play in, my, in encouraging specific curriculum or teaching methodologies. 
In fact, the U.S. Department of Education is explicitly prohibited from dictating local school curriculum in its underlying statutes. Uh, and I think that it, that's a wise decision, regardless of where one uh, falls on the political spectrum. Decisions about what to teach and how to teach should be made at the state and local level by professional educators and parents uh, who know the children and their communities personally, uh, not by uh, bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., or by advocates outside the classroom with a political agenda to advance. Parents and children across the country are still reeling from what I believe was one of the biggest policy missteps of this pandemic. That is the decision of many, if not most, of our nation's public schools to close for nearly two years. The school closures hit the most vulnerable children the hardest. Uh, there were disabilities, uh, those with disabilities, those without access to technology, or parents uh, who could uh, help them, not help them in a virtual environment. Children in minority communities and, and those who had a difficult time learning through computer screens also suffered. The lasting impact of the pandemic on these children has been profound. We've also seen concerning rates of mental health issues, missed preventive care, self-harm, and ongoing lack of engagement, not to mention lost academic and study skills. I'm glad that the importance of in-person learning is now being recognized, and I'm glad to see children back in the classroom. Perhaps this focus on social and emotional learning can help these children regain ground and develop uh, a love of learning again. So to that point, I'm interested in learning from our witnesses today exactly what is meant, and more specifically, uh, what social and emotional learning activities in the classroom look like. Uh, because from what I've uh, been reading, there's certainly uh, some uh, critics of this particular approach. I've read uh, concerns that social and emotional learning is being used as a way to advance radical ideas about race, gender, and sexuality that may not be welcomed by all parents. And, and that even uh, if some of the material is not objectionable, some parents continue to raise concerns about the amount of time uh, spent discussing feelings and current social issues uh, as, con as contrasted with uh, time spent uh, focused on academic subjects and recovering lost ground. Again, I do not believe the federal government should be involved in these uh, decisions. They, they properly belong with parents, teachers, and local school boards. But as we have this hearing today, I am interested in learning more about it uh, from our witnesses and seeing what role the federal government can appropriately play. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming before us today, sharing their time and expertise. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Cole. And with that, I am delighted to welcome and introduce our witnesses, uh, Dr. Pamela Cantor, founder and senior science advisor of Turnaround for Children. And I'll just make a quick comment here. I've um, uh, you worked with uh, Dr. Cantor in the past, and I can recall, if I've got this right, uh, Dr. Cantor, when you were tasked um, with like, taking a, a, a looking from the, the, the mental health uh, issues with regard to children after 9-11, and you, the, the work that you did. And while 9-11 you know, certainly was uh, uh, you know, had impact on our children, but what you found, and I, I think the term you used when we spoke at that time was that it was about grinding poverty that had much more an effect on our children uh, than, than almost any, and, and, uh, and anything else. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, who is president and CEO of the Learning Policy uh, Institute. Thank you, thank you for your body of work uh, in, this, uh, in, in this area. Uh, Dr. Mr. Max Eden, Research Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and welcome to you, uh, Mr. Eden, and Dr. Timothy Schreiber, uh, co-founder and board chair of the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And I would just also say I have uh, um, uh, years and years of a friendship with, uh, with Dr. Schreiber uh, from uh, uh, his days in New Haven, Connecticut, and he could almost be regarded as a townie. I uh, spent so much time there and working with, with Dr. Comer and has devoted uh, his career to uh, dealing with educating our children. So thank you 
uh, very, very much uh, for, for being here. Um, I'm going to remind our witnesses that the entirety of their written testimony will be entered into the record. Um, and uh, our first witness for today will be Dr. Cantor. Uh, and again, your full uh, written testimony will be included. Um, uh, and you are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman DeLauro. If I were to ask any teacher today, what are the biggest challenges you're facing? The answer might be lost learning time or the physical and emotional wellness of your students or that you are just exhausted from the pandemic. What's being asked of us today are solutions to more than one of these challenges at the same time, not a choice between them, which would be a false choice. Our education system was not designed to meet this moment. One lecture in medical school forever changed the way that I looked at human beings, especially children. I was taught that there are 20,000 genes in the human genome, yet in our lifetime, fewer than 10% will ever be expressed. Well, what determines what's in that 10%? It's context the environments, experiences, and relationships in our lives. Context determines who we become, how and what we learn, and even the expression of our genes. The risks and opportunities in development sit inside this one profoundly important point, that there is no separation of nature and nurture, biology and environment, or brain and behavior, only a collaboration between them. This is why developmental and learning science paint an optimistic story of what's possible. Children's brains and bodies and abilities are malleable to experience because the human brain is a dynamic living structure made up of tissue that is the most susceptible to change from experience in the entire human body. The brain is also malleable over time. Most of its growth happens after we're born so there are multiple opportunities to catch up along the way. The message in the science is clear. We need a new design for our schools mapped to the way the brain grows and children learn. A design that recognizes children as whole people, values their assets and supports them to master critical knowledge and skills and to excel in many different ways. Whole child design combines five things positive developmental relationships, environments filled with safety and belonging, rich learning experiences so that students discover what they're capable of, the intentional development of the 21st century skills, mindsets and habits that all successful learners have and integrated supports. But when we use each of these five components together in reinforcing and in integrated ways, whole child design will accelerate recovery from the pandemic, but also promote growth, learning, and wellness for each and every child at the same time. This is a context for learning that is greater than the sum of its parts, personalized, empowering, affirming, and transformative for each student. Let's take this idea into the classroom. If educators teach a math skill like long division, just the skill, some children will learn it, but if they teach to the whole child, educators can support students to understand it, be curious to learn more and be able to apply it to new situations. Students will build analytic skills and even discover parts of themselves they didn't know they had, like maybe I'm a math person after all. When we ask the question, what can we do that will work optimally for this child in this context, that question gets you to fundamentally different answers about the way our schools and our education system of the future needs to be designed. This vision constitutes a transformational shift in the purpose and potential of our learning systems and a shift in the policies and laws that would constrain this vision. To conclude, the message in the science and in this testimony is optimistic. Context shapes the expression of our development and our genetic attributes. This is the biologic truth. 
and schools designed using this knowledge will be able to see and unleash talent and potential and ensure that each and every young person can thrive. Thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cantor, for your testimony. And our next witness is Dr. Linda Carling Hammond. And again, your full written testimony will be included in the record. And you're now recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, members of the subcommittee, uh, for your invitation to participate in this hearing. I'm honored to be here today to discuss the federal role in supporting whole child practices uh, that can support children's learning. As Dr. Cantor noted, the latest research from neuroscience and other disciplines shows that emotions and relationships influence learning. Positive emotions, such as interest, excitement, and trust to the teacher facilitate learning. Negative emotions, such caused by trauma, anxiety, or self-doubt, reduce the capacity of the brain to process information and to learn. Students' interpersonal skills, their ability to interact positively with peers and adults, resolve conflicts, and work in teams all contribute to effective learning and lifelong behaviors. The Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning identifies five main areas of social emotional competence, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. In addition, traits such as a growth mindset that allow us to understand that we can improve our work with effort and that we should not give up when we experience setbacks, create perseverance and resilience. These are skills that employers say are among the most important for success in work and that research demonstrates are important for success in life. As Chair DeLauro noted, and as I describe in my written testimony, among the hundreds of studies on this topic are several meta-analyses that show the benefits of social emotional learning for students' behavior, uh, school safety, attitudes, grades, and test scores. Social emotional learning is not a specific curriculum. Just as teachers focus on adding and subtracting in math, regardless of what curriculum they use, they can focus on helping students learn to work well with others and manage themselves in many different ways from a many different curricular starting points. A recent study from the Fordham Foundation also shows that parents, regardless of their party affiliation, recognize the importance of these skills. They want their children to learn how to set and achieve goals, navigate social situations, empathize with others, respond ethically, and manage their emotions. The study concluded that when such programs are described without jargon, support soars on both sides of the aisle. Because of this broad support, all 50 states and DC have social emotional learning standards for preschool students, and at least 18 have standards for K-12 students. Teaching these skills does not detract from academics, but supports it. They can be folded into all aspects of school, including how conflicts are resolved in the playground, how students learn to take a deep breath and calm themselves when something disturbing has happened, how students develop a growth mindset as they revise their essays in English class, and how they learn to collaborate effectively in their science investigations. Research also shows that in order to thrive and learn, children need stability in their lives, good nutrition, health care, and supports when they have trauma, which creates a toxic stress reaction that affects brain development, physical health, learning, and behavior. Even before the pandemic, 46 million children were exposed each year to violence, crime, abuse, homelessness, or food insecurity. These experiences, of course, have been exacerbated by the pandemic, but many states and districts are fortunately investing in community school approaches, including California, Maryland, New Mexico, New York, Vermont. These initiatives integrate education and health, mental health and social welfare supports. They offer expanded and enriched learning time. They involve parents and community organizations in wrapping around children and their needs. A recent review of more than 140 studies found that well-implemented community schools support improved attendance, achievement, and attainment. As Chair DeLauro has already noted, Congress has supported many aspects of a whole child framework in its last annual spending bills. To build on these foundations, I will mention four things the Congress can do. First, continue efforts to support states and districts implementing social emotional learning and whole child approaches to education by expanding funding for the school safety and national activities program and creating competitive grants to redesign schools around the principles that Dr. Cantor outlined. 
Second, catalyze the expansion of community school initiatives through sustained increases in additional funding under ESSA titles one and four, among other sources. Third, increase investments in preparation and ongoing professional development for educators under Title II of ESSA and HEA so they can support safe, inclusive, and positive learning environments. And finally, promote alignment and interagency coordination of federal funds across the 10 departments and hundreds of programs that are currently administered in a fragmented manner. Thank you for your focus on this issue and for the opportunity to share ideas for a path forward. I'm happy to answer any questions that the members of the subcommittee have. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Hammond. And our next witness is Mr. Max Eden, research fellow. Um, uh, and your full testimony is included in the record. You are now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Eden, for being yeah, here. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. And, and thank you all so much for the opportunity to address uh, this very important issue. Social emotional learning is a burgeoning education industry. From November 2019 to April 2021, SEL spending increased by 45% to $765 million. If it isn't already, it will likely soon become a billion dollar education subsector. Advocates claim that SEL holds great promise and on its face, it sounds like a very sensible idea. But my research has led me to be more alarmed than optimistic. For four reasons, I fear that the costs of SEL may substantially outweigh the benefits. The first reason, the evidence of the benefits has been substantially exaggerated. Advocates promote claims like $1 of SEL spending yields $11 in return. This would be astonishing if true, but is it really? A clear-eyed view of the evidence suggests perhaps not. The, the 2017 Rand Corporation study, which examined the evidence base for SEL, separated it by tiers of evidence. Within the top tier for rigorous evidence, no studies demonstrated academic benefits, academic achievement benefits. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of less rigorously designed studies that show positive results. Researchers can and have retroactively attached the label of SEL onto these studies, regardless of whether these studies <laughs> involve what we now know as SEL uh, implementations and practices. The merits of these studies can be debated. We can talk about what conclusions we can and can't draw from them, but they certainly do not rise to the level of a settled social science that provides reliable predictive value. Furthermore, the relevance of this literature may be categorically questionable because of the rise of what's called transformative SEL. And this leads us to the second cause for concern. The concern is that SEL has become an ideologically charged enterprise. In 2018 and 2019, SEL was bipartisan. The notion that schools could help, should help kids develop competencies like self-awareness and self-management sounded good to folks on both sides of the aisle. Back then, however, I was somewhat skeptical of the sustainability of what seemed to be an effort at values-free moral education. Uh, but in 2019 and 2020, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning embraced transformative SEL infusing the project with values values derived from the left academic canon commonly referred to as critical race theory. Self-awareness now involves intersectionality. Self-management now involves resistance. Castle's documents and its leaders have openly embraced anti-racism. As commonly defined, anti-racism amounts to an essentially totalizing ideological commitment. A recent Washington Post article was titled In SEL, The Right Sees Critical Race Theory, and pointed to transformative SEL as the cause. The reason parents see it there is because they read it there. Now it is of course an open question to what extent those words and those statements really do filter down to classroom practice. Uh, and it's very hard to draw an immediate generalization, but parents have a plain facial reason for concern that what is being called social and emotional could prove in practice to be political and ideological. Uh, another big concern for parents is data security. SEL implementation is frequently accompanied by school surveys that ask psychological and personal questions relating to students' mood, family life, and even their sexuality. The more extensive and sensitive this data becomes, the more valuable it becomes to potential hackers. Last month, 820,000 students in New York City learned that their data was hacked. We should expect more of this as a matter of structural inevitability, inevitability given the increasing value of the data collected. Now, even if we could perfectly guarantee data security and also guarantee that no vestiges of political ideology seep into classroom practice around SEL, 
there remains a fourth and probably insuperable concern. And that concern is that SEL in practice can tend to resemble the practice of unlicensed therapy. My uh, colleague, Robert Pendicio, has uh, addressed this concern at length in an excellent report titled The Unexamined Rise of Therapeutic Education. Uh, although it may not always be explicit within training materials, in practice, it does invite teachers to play the armchair psychologist. Identifying root causes of trauma, providing students with a schema to understand themselves, and explaining how best to relate to others. In theory and practice, it also tends to blend seamlessly with a rising emphasis on school-based mental health provision. And while we certainly want students to be mentally healthy, there are very good reasons why medical ethics prohibits the practice of unlicensed therapy. Untrained adults trying to do good can do a great deal of damage. And this is my overriding concern with the entire SEL enterprise, that when schools, which are still struggling to effectively teach reading and math, extend their ambition to embrace the whole child, they may end up doing more harm than good. Thank you, Mr. Eden. And now let me ask Dr. Timothy Shriver. Uh, and just once again, we've written testimony, the full written testimony is included in the record and it's recognized now for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ranking Member Cole, both of you and all the members here. Uh, uh, Congressman DeLauro, I, I'm including in my background today a picture from your home district from the New Haven Public Schools taken some 30 years ago with Dr. James Comer in it because he's my is. mentor and in some yes. ways uh, the founder of this field. Uh, and Congressman Cole, I, I want you to know that uh, your, your questions and concerns are valid, but these faces behind me are the ones we, I hope, will see most in this hearing today. Uh, I want to thank, um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for your longtime support for broad uh, bipartisan education uh, initiatives, Head Start to name one, in some ways was a precursor to the field of social and emotional learning we're hearing about today. Parent engagement, supports for early childhood development, social and emotional and academic integration in these early childhood centers. In some ways, we are 40, 50 years of trying to figure out how to capitalize on the broad bipartisan consensus that emerged way back in the 60s. That Dr. Comer himself was a pioneer in, and many others, in showing us that children develop through these malleable interlocking uh, systems that uh, Dr. Cantor and Dr. Darling Hammond mentioned, that we do not have a choice between whether or not to support the social and emotional development and the cognitive development. There is no either or. Uh, notwithstanding uh, Mr. Eden's uh, comments about insuperability and the separation of these things, children, no brain ever came to school without a body. No mind ever came to school without wanting to matter. No search for knowledge was ever disconnected from the search for meaning or importance or relevance in the world. There is no such thing as a child that learns purely cognitively or acquires only information. The only question we have before us and the only question I dare say you have before you is how well we will support the social and emotional development of children because it is foundational as Dr. Cantor has said and Dr. Darling Hammond to the brain science, the learning science and to common sense. We know this as human beings. We've seen, I see Representative Butler's child there. There's no question, hi, uh, that, that that child like all of us learns uh, in an integrated way. So the science is not settled. There's no question about that. This is an early days issue. There's lots of research to be done. There's every indication that social and emotional learning is promising, if not effective. Uh, Mr. Eden's comments are uh, uh, fine as far as they go in, in challenging us to make the research more effective. But the idea that we have a choice to turn our back on the work because we have more research to do is in my, in my view, uh, unsustainable. Uh, in some ways, all of this comes down to how we support the day-to-day -day experiences of children. Uh, Congressman Blora, we've thought at times, I've talked about maybe we need social and emotional learning in Congress, because uh, what we teach our children when they have stress is we teach them how to turtle. We say, you know, put your arms across your shoulders and drop down into your shell and take three deep breaths and experience some positive self-talk and don't react too quickly. And what you do when, when, you, when you find is you can teach this to a first grade, how to turtle, how to manage stress. And you find your responses are much more effective. We teach lessons on, and you learn more 
Mr. Eden's point, and you, you're more capable of paying attention and your brain is more locked in and your relationships are stronger. Same thing, uh, Congressman Cole, you, you brought up these very important questions about whether this belongs. But when we think about what it actually is, one of the lessons, for instance, we teach to high school children is how to disagree without being disagreeable, which is, a, as my understanding at least, an extraordinarily important skill in Congress, right? How do we disagree in a productive, meaningful way? Our, the citizens of this country are asking these questions of the adults in our communities, not just of children. Uh, they're asking it of all of us not just of our fourth or sixth or eighth graders. Uh, the last focus group I did with young people a few, uh, uh, about a year ago, one of the kids said to me, you know, Mr. Schreiber, we've gotten so much better at bullying in our school, but adults are still bullies. Um, he said, I think and so in some ways, this field is seeding not just the supports for children and learning, but the shifting of the systems that surrounds children and learning so that they can be attentive to this great consensus that exists in America after the pandemic, uh, I dare say we have a very robust consensus on the need to support the social and emotional and mental health of our children. Parents are starving. They're desperate, they're exhausted, and they're searching. Can anyone help me support my kid? I don't know what to do next. Our chance is to answer that affirmatively. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm on mute. Okay, there we go. Thank you very, very much for all your testimony. I appreciate it. And we will, you know, get, get started with the questioning and I will kick it off. And, uh, and, and, and Dr. Schreiber, you, 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 um, you made a couple of points in this direction, but I want to ask uh, Dr. Darling Hammond and yourself. Uh, and in his written testimony, Mr. Reading claims that the evidence base for SEL has been, quote, vastly oversold. Um, specifically, he calls into question the validity of research supporting SEL. Can you both respond to his assertions and speak to the evidence based supporting social, emotional, and cognitive uh, learning? Uh, Dr. Hammond? Uh, well, there's a substantial evidence base. And the way we think about evidence in research is the uh, accrual of um, triangulated evidence that comes from many different sources that points in the same direction. Uh, you mentioned in your earlier remarks the uh, relatively famous meta analysis. Uh, of 213 studies that represents 270,000 students from urban, suburban, and rural schools, you know, that was done some years ago that found that students who participated in social emotional learning programs uh, that teach those things like self-management uh, and collaborating with others showed greater improvements than comparison students in their social emotional skills, their attitudes about themselves and others in school, social and classroom behavior, school grades and test scores. Uh, on average, across all those studies, uh, averaging uh, those that measured uh, achievement at average 11 percentile gain in um, achievement scores. Um, but equally important is the fact that in their schools, there was more safety, more affirmation, less bullying, which all of which also uh, support the desire to go to school, the capacity to learn while there. Uh, after that, there was another meta-analysis that found that benefits were sustained in the long term, showing how the learned skills and attitudes can endure and serve as a protective factor, uh, both supporting uh, academic success, but also protecting students from mental health difficulties. Uh, even more recently, there was a meta-analysis of 54 studies of classroom management programs that found that all of the, the approaches had positive effects, but the most uh, positive, the most substantial, were the interventions that focused on social emotional development of students, helping them learn how to be responsible citizens of the classroom uh, so that that could carry over into all of their other stages. You can manage a classroom by saying, if you do this, you get punished. And if you do the other thing, you'll get uh, rewarded. Or, and you can also manage a classroom by teaching students how to be knowledgeable about themselves, aware of other people, responsible citizens of the classroom. And the second of those is what lasts into uh, one's life and future. Uh, Mr. Eden noted that the RAND Corporation study um, did not find uh, uh, as much evidence of academic achievement, but I want to note that in that study, they explicitly excluded interventions 
that were focused on promoting academic achievement in disciplines such as reading and math. They intentionally focused on those that measured social emotional learning outcomes. So most of the studies they chose to review did not measure academic achievement, uh, but they did find that all 60 studies improved outcomes in social emotional learning competencies and also improved safety climate uh, and uh, civil engagement and academic achievement and attainment in about a quarter of those studies. Um, and ultimately the authors of that study uh, were confident that uh, there were several reasons that schools and educators should view social emotional learning as a priority uh, based on the evidence that they reviewed. So I think that there's always more research to be done as a researcher. I will always say that that is true, uh, but I, there is a quite substantial evidence base uh, already that points us in a direction that we can act on. I don't know, uh, Dr. Schreiber, if you want to make a comment on that, I also would like to try to get in a question for-, uh, for Yeah, Dr. maybe Chan. just very briefly, Madam Chair, just very briefly, just let me just also point out because many members of this committee have also been big supporters of the Special Olympics movement and the work uh, that Special Olympics does in schools. Special Olympics has designed, uh, if you will, an intervention using social and emotional learning foundational principles, empathy, perspective taking, moral courage, universal values. The numbers are off the charts when you invite children into these experiences. So the kinds of interventions that are using these strategies, Congressman Cole has been very supportive of this work. It, they're common sense American values. I mean, the, we teach Jefferson and the creativity and of Franklin, and we teach the resilience of Tubman and the search for justice of Cesar Chavez. We ought to not just be teaching about those people, but teaching children to be those people and to have the skills and qualities and values that enable them to grow and develop into being citizens of the country. These are citizenship skills as much as they are, you know, uh, uh, affective skills. So I would just say that the data is very prominent, uh, Madam Chair, uh, not just in the core research areas that, that are being discussed here, because that's all been mentioned here, but also in the related programs and youth serving organizations that are using these principles for very positive outcomes. Thank you both. And what I will do since my time has expired, I will move, when we move to a second round, uh, I want to engage with, uh, uh, with Dr. Cantor as well. And with that, let me yield to uh, uh, my colleague, Congressman Cole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me just, and I would ask this of each of you, and uh, uh, we'll just move right down the line, uh, just to help me get a better understanding. Can you provide some examples of the types of exercises, what they would look like in uh, classrooms to help students with social emotional skills? What are the you know, some specific examples of techniques that uh, uh, an instructor would use with a student. And I'll start with you, if I may, uh, Dr. Cantor, and we'll just sort of move down the line. I think you're on mute. There we go. So imagine that you give a student a challenging project, academic project. And they take a look at this project and they have this feeling, I can't do it. And let's say even that they shut down because they're nervous that they're not gonna be able to do it or not gonna be able to do it well. What, is, what does the teacher do in that moment that inspires that child to believe that they can not only do the project, but do it well? So the pedagogical techniques of a teacher in that moment are to recognize how a student is struggling and to be able to do the thing at that moment that enables that student to persevere through it. Now, you wouldn't call that necessarily by the label social and emotional learning, but you would recognize that you are teaching at that moment a student to have a growth mindset I believe in myself, to stick with it, perseverance, to be able to transfer the knowledge of this project that you just succeeded at to other projects. So your confidence builds that you can do other things. I think right now the labels could be getting in our way because I think the universals here are what do we want every single child to believe about themselves and to be able to do. I think that's what Tim Shriver said just a few minutes ago. 
Okay, and uh, if I can keep going, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Darling Hammond, what would be, again, some of the techniques that, in a practical sense, somebody would use in a classroom? Well, one of the things that a lot of teachers use in a classroom is group work. Students get together and they have a project or an activity or an inquiry that they're going into. And to do that effectively, there are specific ways to engage in that group work that allow students to take roles that will allow them to figure out who's doing what, uh, to be respectful to one another, to so teach specific ways to listen uh, and uh, to respond to each other, to be sure people are included. Uh, those, all of those skills of group work uh, and collaboration are the social emotional learning skills that uh, teachers will teach in the context of helping kids do the academic work much more effectively. We've probably all had experiences of bad group work and good group work. And the difference is whether those skills were taught in the process. Another one would be conflict resolution. You know, things come up, you know, somebody took somebody's pencil or something happened on the playground. So teaching students ways to stop, listen to each other, express their um, feelings or their views and come to a resolution. And there are some specific strategies that people have used across schools to do that is another example of teaching those skills that will go on through the classroom and into life with those students. Well, to Dr. Shriver's point, we have plenty of examples of bad and good group work in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And Amen. I would say our recent omnibus was good group work. So. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have a lot of time left. Let me go quickly to you, Dr. Shriver, and then to you, Mr. Eden. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Congressman Cole. I mean, look, again, some of this is common sense. I'll just give you one a good example on the um, uh, conflict side of things. So being, di being able to disagree without being disagreeable assumes a, a series of skills that kids can learn. One of them is how to presume positive intent. So Mr. Eden and I currently don't necessarily agree on all these things, right? But we've spent the last five to seven years, progressives and conservative leaning educators, trying to learn how to presume positive intent. So that as I listen to him, I feel like I'm trying to train my, my ear and my mind to identify what about his intent I can see is really in the interest of children. I'm just using this current example because it's right in front of us, right? So. Presuming positive intent is very powerful for kids. And it's a lifelong skill. And you can teach it. Sorry, I'm over time. Well, I hope that's yeah, okay, Max. Know, it's okay. No, I can just give Mr. Eden a quick chance to, to add. Um, yeah, very, very quickly. Um, I mean, one, one common technique uh, is the technique of role playing for conflict resolution, conflict management. Uh, the question of what is being played within these roles is an important question. And just, you know, from this week, talking to some educators, I came across an example of a school counselor doing role playing with middle school students on how to break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend. This raises many questions about kind of the appropriate role for adults vis-a-vis -vis students uh, in guiding romantic relationships and is part and parcel of uh, what I fear with very good intent, Mr. <laughs> Dr. Shriver, uh, could be an encroaching and a passing over a boundary that parents uh, would not want adults speaking to their students about, would not want adults training them with positive intent in for fear that what will be trained will not align with their values. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the indulgence, Madam Chair. Yield back. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. M Mr. Pocan, and let me uh, mention this, Mr. Pocan. I I'm going to jump off to do something in the MillCon, which is meeting at the same time and to get back on. So uh, asking you to, uh, to take, the, uh, take the gavel in the chair. So Congressman Pocan. Absolutely, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you. And thanks to our witnesses. Um, uh, especially good to see uh, Dr. Shriver. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm a big fan of Special Olympics and all the work you've done uh, there. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank um, you. Thank you. I, I think my... Uh, Biggest question, I, I, you've talked a lot about the effect on students and you know one of the problems that I'm hearing, we know it's a national problem in our districts, is teacher retention. Um, you know, between some public policy attacks, the last couple of years under COVID, a number of factors, uh, you know, we're having a hard time keeping teachers. Uh, we've had very few applicants for some open positions, including in the biggest city in my district in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm just wondering how um, teachers look at this and if this could be perhaps something to help uh, to stop the slide of decline that we're having on teacher retention. So, you know, maybe for the three doctors, if you could each uh, just. 
I think Dr. Right. Darlingham <clears throat> and his, oh, sorry. Maybe I'll kick off because it's an area I've spent a lot of time on. Um, Thank you. The, yeah, the, um, the use of social and emotional learning strategies actually has been found to support teacher retention in uh, work that's been done on that because as the classroom and the school become more uh, calm, more safe, more uh, organized and managed through the use of those programs, teachers get the benefit of a class that is easier to teach. They also learn strategies that help their social and emotional learning and uh, competence, which makes them more efficacious in their work. Uh, and uh, they can benefit uh, themselves by developing those strategies to maintain calm and to be able to focus their attention in the right ways. So it's a very helpful piece of the puzzle with respect to um, teacher retention. Right now, a lot of kids are coming back to school having experienced trauma with dysregulated behavior that is a result of that. And it's especially important for what teachers and other educators are experiencing right now to have these supports. Another example that I could add to this is a district that I happened to be visiting yesterday. It's outside of San Diego. Um, El Cajon. And I, what was described to me was that this is a district with a waiting list of teachers who want to work there. So when you dig into why, why does this district have a waiting list of people who want to work there? Underneath all of that is the culture, the culture that is district wide, that is modeled by the adults and therefore also modeled by the kids. So there's a very, very powerful effect. And, and we know this in other fields, um, the connection between culture and the satisfaction of employees and their retention. Great, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Pugin, I'll just add one uh, slightly unrelated, well, related point. Um, uh, the, the, the great longitudinal study, some of you may be familiar with the grant study, which studied what leads to happiness in life. You know, now we're, I think, in the 80th year of the study. Uh, the current principal investigator, Dr. Robert Waldinger, concludes that after millions of pages of data, they can conclude one thing, that the quality of the relationships is the only thing that matters to the quality of life. Uh, this work is designed to strengthen the relationships, not just for kids, but for teachers. Most of us went into teaching because we cared so deeply about children. Yes, some of us love the Civil War or Shakespeare or poetry or language arts or whatever, or the periodic table, but most of us went into it because we wanted to connect with kids. And when those relationships are broken and tense and fractured and angry and hostile, burnout is inevitable. And then when you add to that the layers of political you know, uh, conflict and uh, aggression from outside forces, it's overwhelming, right? You just can't survive it. But when the relationships are strong, my goodness, you, know, you, you find what you came there for, if you will. So just at a very basic level, if you could imagine work that helps teachers strengthen the quality of their relationships with children is almost directly uh, related to the quality of their capacity to, to want to stay in the profession. Great, thank you. And I have 35 seconds. I don't know if one person could answer, and I know this is a longer question, but um, is there any kind of one type of student that benefits most? I know I can clearly see benefits for every type of student, but is there a, a type of student that benefits the most? Well, I, I would I'll just- take that one. Oh. Go ahead, Tim. I just say the answer is every, this is about every child. This is, yes, there are children who benefit uh, in outsized ways, but this is just good child development. It's for every child and therefore uh, really for all of us. Gotcha, great, thank you. And we got down to the perfect timing, uh, appreciate it. Uh, next up, I have uh, Representative Harris. You represent, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Eden, I'd like to uh, delve a little bit into your testimony because uh, it's interesting, you know, as a physician, we always look at the quality, you know, the, these uh, internal and external validations, the quality of the study, and then whether it's actually appropriate to, the, to what we're thinking about. And, you know, when we do preventive service task force, you rate things good, fair, poor, and then you base your recommendations on that. So uh, at first, it's very concerning to me that none of the studies uh, that have shown a benefit are highly rated. That, that is, and we learned during COVID that you know, the quality of scientific information was very important. So as we approach a, a billion dollar industry, 
it's very concerning that there are no high quality studies apparently that show a benefit. Uh, so is that basically, is that what your testimony suggests? Uh, my testimony suggests that <clears throat> the kind of randomized control trial gold standard, what physicians you know, recognize as proof of concept uh, are far fewer, there, <laughs> far fewer and further between than what we're being presented, which is meta-analytic meta results, right? Sure. This, uh, this meta-analysis that is frequently referenced that has, I think, 215, 213 Absolutely. studies. Absolutely. And, and um, again, I understand, it, and it appears that the vast majority of those, if not all of them, are not the highest quality. And then you're making conclusions based on relatively poor data. And, and this is the whole, again, the whole purpose of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, look at quality of data, et cetera. Now, of particular concern is the external validity. Mm -hmm. Which is to say that, you know, in a medical treatment, if you actually change the type of treatment or slightly modify the drug, then looking at past studies of the past therapies and then trying to extrapolate into the new version is absolutely scientifically invalid. I mean, it's just, look, it might be true, but it's scientifically invalid to extrapolate. So your ob observation, which I think is borne out with what's going on at the school level of a radical change in what SEL was all about occurring in the last three years is very worrisome. For instance, we have a, and this is in, from my state, from, because you actually mentioned uh, the Parents Defending Education, I guess the name of the organization. You know, you go to their website and this is in my state, a third grade elementary school instruction team leader and rainbow representative in, the, in that school system sent an email to colleagues full of excitement about plans to incorporate LGBTQ within our elementary curriculum explicitly stating this would be integrated during SEL time. Well, now the, the Florida law looks more important. When you have a third grader being taught LGBTQ during SEL time. So this is kind of the, the, you know, the camel's nose under the tent. I understand CRT. I didn't understand its extrapolation and other things into SEL, which is something we have to be very cautious about because, of course, the North Harford Public School System, again, Parents Defending Education website, has gender literacy embedded in their SEL elementary school curriculum. Like, I'm sorry, uh, you know, we need to produce, and, and last but not least, I want you to comment on this idea that we are urging, that, that an important part of this is to urge students to be community activists, because in my district, we had a major problem a couple of years ago when one of our school superintendents urged their, her, her students in the system to attend Black Lives Matter rallies. Now remember, Black Lives Matter is a Marx, it was an institution founded on Marxist principles to somehow, without putting it in full context, urge students to attend Black Lives Matter rallies. Now, is that the kind of community activism that you see creeping into the new definition of SEL that Castle is, uh, you know, promulgating. Uh, it, it certainly can be. When you look at Castle documents, they say that they want a commitment to anti-racism, which, as I said, is an ideological doctrine. They say they want uh, justice-oriented citizens, which obviously begs the question that we know what justice is. <laughs> um, and I would like to just, you know, briefly draw attention to something Dr. Sharver said, which I think was offered in the best intent, but falls on other ears is very alarming, right? the question of meaning and the question of whether school should be in the business of providing students with meaning. And then the question of, well, what meaning will the school tell students their lives have? Uh, and these concepts blend very, very subtly, right? You have a buzzword like SEL, you have studies of various quality that you use to validate it. You fill the buzzword with any given concept and you don't know, it's very hard to tell how widespread is it that SEL is being used as a Trojan horse, but the vector by which it can be is clear. There are examples of it, and it is not, you know, it it it, it is not it is not it is not not of a piece with kind of the rest of what we're hearing in this testimony from other witnesses. Now, thank you very much. We just got to get back to reading, writing, and arithmetic. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Harris. Uh, Representative Frankel, uh, you're recognized for five minutes of questions. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to the panelists. Well, I want to say I'm glad. I'm glad there's been a lot of research on this, but I would just tell you my, my common sense as a mother and a grandmother, uh, and I've been uh, around lots of little kids my entire lives and so forth. I, I, I could just say there's no question about the importance of a healthy no. emotional development. And 
uh, you know, right now in uh, Broward County, which is just south of me, there is the death penalty phase of someone who killed dozens and dozens of people in the Parkland shooting. A perfect example of a of a, uh, a a young man who did not have good emotional development. Uh, now that's an extreme case, but I I, I want to talk about my home state of Florida, which is I'm telling you we're in a race with with uh, Texas for the craziest governor and legislature, in my opinion. And um, so they let's see what they did this year. You know, I, just to let you know. Uh, we have affordable housing's gone up, the flood insurance has gone up, but that wasn't dealt with, but they did do this. They enacted the don't say gay bill and banning critical race theory. And I, uh, even though there is no such thing as teaching critical race theory, but uh, you know, what, what the, the ban on the, the don't say uh, gay bill bans any classroom discussion on gender, gender identity and sexual orientation in grades K through three and bans any discussion that any parent might find inappropriate in grades K through 12 where the teachers are just all gagged up now in Florida. Um, I would like to have any of the panelists if you wanted to comment on this in, in terms of what that is a potential threat for our children. And the community. Uh, I'd like to comment on that. One of the things that we know from many, many, many studies on positive youth development is that kids will struggle to learn and focus if they do not feel safe physically, safe emotionally, and frankly, identity safe. When kids are othered, you are setting in motion a process by which bullying can be promoted where kids will walk into school and be afraid that they and their identities and their cultures are not welcomed and not affirmed. So there are a couple of problems with that. One, it produces fear and anxiety walking in the school door. Second, when kids are anxious and fearful, they can't concentrate. And then on top of that, you're not giving the classroom a language for tolerance, for being able to know how to behave around people that are different than you. So citizenship, something that we prize in this country, has a great deal to do with experiences with people that are different than us. Yeah, I, yeah go ahead. I can make a couple of comments on it. I mean, um, you know, that obviously was not the name of the bill at all. It was the parental rights and education bill. And I've seen polling that suggests that uh, the majority of Florida Democrats agree with it. They agree that it is not appropriate to teach uh, sexuality, gender, gender orientation, sexual orientation in two, five to nine year olds. Uh, this is not something that we've historically done. Frankly, the best argument against the bill was this is not something that we're doing. Uh, but as Mr. Harris and I were discussing, this is something that can start to happen under the guise of SEL and raises profound questions about how developmentally appropriate it is to be teaching about gender identity to kids who believe the tooth fairy is real. Do we really know that this will help? Do we have any studies whatsoever to suggest uh, that this is in their best interest over the long term? I would, I would be you know, very interested in reading them. Uh, I don't believe it has. This is a very novel development. And I think you know, when you have most Democrats supporting the bill, I think Max, maybe I would like to um, listen. Most Democrats do not support it. Most normal people, if they would understand and be able to have a discussion other than a 10 second poll. But I'd like to see if any of the other panelists would like to respond to your comment. Thank, thank you, Mr. Eden. I do appreciate your point of view. I don't agree with it, but would any of the panelists like to re respond to that? Okay, they're giving up. But anyway, thank you very much. It was a it was a interesting discussion. Be careful when you go to Florida. You know what not to say. <laughs> I yield back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura, let me uh, thank uh, Congressman Pocan uh, for stepping in. I really appreciate it. And let me now recognize Congresswoman Herrera Butler. And where's 
Where's our little friend here? Oh, I was begging my husband to lock them all out. Oh um, God, no. no, bedroom. no, no, no. They're driving me batty. I love <laughs> them, but- What's his, what's I, his I, name? I just, what's his that, name? That one was Ethan, Ethan. That's my five-year-old. Okay, He's, lovely, he, that's great. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I can so relate with parents and pandemics and academics and social emotional well-being because ours in our house ebbs and flows on a daily basis. Um, so I find this a really interesting conversation. Um, and I have some questions, although just if I put take my lawmaker hat off and I put my mom hat on, I will tell you one of the reasons I think parents are so attuned to these conversations and what policymakers are discussing is because um, even just the, the I don't know, um, the, I feel like even lack of just comedy or graciousness with which we're addressing some of these things causes me to say, gosh, and these are you, you, I mean, I look doctors and members of Congress and chairs of committee, right? You know, these are in theory are the, the highest levels of, of attainment in our society. And yet we're having major disagreements. And, and if we disagree, rather than disagree, we're like digging at each other. And so when I look at that, I think, how in the world could I expect an educator with a ton of kids in her classroom and all those kids are like my kid <laughs> who I'm like, just sit still, just for the love of God, sit still. I just think I, that's part of why I do have a lot of questions about whether there is infrastructure. So even if everybody agreed on what the curriculum or the teaching here was, whether there's the infrastructure to do it in the way that it's being proposed and, or so, so there's just a lot of, this raises a lot of questions. Um, I mean, obviously my observation is we're all striving for the same thing. We want our children to be poured into, to be nurtured, to learn how to do, um, how to uh, the academic, the rigor of ac academia to be able to compete on a global stage, right? They're not competing against kids down the street. Like, like I was, they're competing with kids from China and India um, who are hungry for, for achievement. And our kids are dealing with, you know, uh, parents who, who can't decide what a, the classroom structure should be. And I, I really wonder, I think we're, we are wanting to do the right thing, but sometimes I question whether we're going to, whether we're, we're going to put aside our personal feelings about some of this and do what's in the best interest of the kids, which is why I know all of you, as you've, as you've, as you've gotten into this line of work, why you've done it, because that's your heart. I wanted to ask, um, I, I was really, and maybe this is for Dr. Cantor uh, and Mr. Eden, I think you probably also have some thoughts on this, about the ability of teachers within the classroom to address the mental health issues that we know are there. When I talk with my educational, um, you know, my directors, my school boards, they will tell you the number one thing they're worried about right now is the mental health of their kids. They can't even get to the academics because the mental health is in a pretty crisis state. One of the concerns I have is how do we get them into mental health services and do we think teachers really can be trained to do this and, and do we want them doing it? I have educators who would tell me they, they don't and maybe for both of you, I'd like to hear both of your comments on that. Dr. Kenner, can we start with you? Sure. One of the questions that, that I was often asked when I was practicing as a child psychiatrist, which I did for about 20 years, what is the active ingredient of a therapy? Okay, is it all the things I studied in medical school or is it the experience I'm having with a child in the moment in my office as I build trust with them, as I build a relationship with them? So if I were to say to you, what can a teacher do on behalf of the emotional well-being of every student? It is to support knowing them, caring about them, and, and really having a, a classroom in which every child feels known, loved, and connected with. Now you can do that in different ways because I've also had teachers say, how can I have a relationship with 30 kids? Well, okay, very, very challenging, but there are advisories, there are structures that can be put in place. There is even group work that Linda was talking about where a student can feel known, cared for, and loved. Relationships are the greatest preventive mental health intervention that there is. And they are also great for learning. So that's the no brainer here. That's what I would say is in the province of teachers. 
Thank you, Dr. Mr. Eden. Yeah, I think the the distance between you know the studies that we that we have of programs that you know may or may not have been reliably evaluated and what really happens, as you said, is huge. Frequently, what happens when I talk to teachers is, oh, we're supposed to do SEL. Okay, let's go to Google, let's go to Pinterest, let's find some things that are labeled SEL and let's try them. Vast difference between whatever we might have validated and what's actually happening under the skies. And I've also talked to a lot of teachers who have said, I just want to teach. I don't want this burden on my shoulders. I don't, I'm not trained to do this suicide prevention. That's not, I don't, what if it goes wrong? What if we're acclimating them mm -hmm. to these thoughts? Um, I think that there is uh, a large sentiment in teachers that, you know, just let us teach. Don't make us do more than we're already doing. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. You'll back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Watson, Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and Ranking Member Cole. Thank you for this. It's really interesting. Uh, I'm learning a lot, and I know I don't know a lot. Uh, Ms. Dr. Shriver, let me just tell you, you said something that really stirred me, and that was presuming a positive intent, and therefore presuming a positive outcome. I am really, I, I want to know, first of all, first of all, I kind of agree that this is more of an approach of a teacher, how you teach, how you interact, and how you help students develop, then it's actually being a thing that you set aside an hour a day and, and, and work on. I wanna know, are, are students who are being taught to be teachers now, being taught this as a um, sort of a, a method of, of teaching and approach to teaching, Dr. Shriver, do you know? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I'll yield to Dr. Darling Hammond, whose who's, okay. uh, scholarship and work in the field of teacher education is legendary around the world. I'll just say, uh, when I was trained as a teacher, the answer was no. I had in yeah. three degrees in education, one class in child development, uh, which is backwards, right? It's, it's indicative of a system that doesn't see the child as the primary goal. It sees information as the primary goal. You don't, as I said earlier, you have to choose. The yeah. next generation of teachers, we believe, uh, the essential reform effort, if you can, if we can call it that, uh, will be to equip teachers with intensive understanding of child development, not so that they can uh, get embroiled in political yeah. disputes, but so that they can adapt to the behavior. And as Dr. Cantor said earlier, the situation, the context, the pedagogy, the skills necessary to help a child go from A to B in terms of their learning. Dr. Darling Hammond, I guilt to you. I'm watching the clock. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Darling Hammond, do you have anything you want to add to that? I would simply say that there is a lot of work going on right now to infuse this kind of knowledge base in teacher education and in leader preparation. Those are equally important and those are areas where congressional investment could be helpful. Are we investing in current teachers to sort of bring them up to date in this sort of holistic, emotional and um, uh, what do you call it? Social and emotional learning sort of paradigm into their uh, way, the way they teach. Are we, are we supporting that sufficiently? Do we need greater we, investment in it? We, we uh, invest very little in uh, educator preparation programs in this country mm -hmm. from the federal level. And uh, there is a need to kind of move uh, the agenda, the um, curriculum of teacher and leader preparation programs to accommodate the science uh, that has been developed around how people learn uh, and ensure that that knowledge base gets to them just in the same way as we do in medicine uh, and uh, we do in other professions. So I wanna to talk to you as um, a, a grandmother of, of a beautiful black nine-year-old. And I wanna to talk to you as a black person. Um, the one thing I want is for children, irrespective of their race, their color, or whatever, to feel equally valued, to um, believe that they're as great and as accomplishable as anybody else. I also want those that are not um, Black or of color or different to embrace the differences that they see as opportunities and not as a, a negatives. And so I'm wondering, Dr. Shriver, maybe in my few, minute, few seconds left, you could tell me 
how we approach SEL to ensure that there is this, this equity, this appreciation, that we overcome this sort of over-disciplining of Black kids in school, that we help them all to um, uh, de de determine the outcome of disagreements in less disagreeable ways, how we can uh, minimize uh, the bullying, et cetera. I'm very concerned about what's happening in our, our schools and the kind of political pawns schools are being uh, made under these false pretenses of teaching CRT or whatever. It's, it's ridiculous, it's sickening, and I wanna know how we overcome that with uh, approaching the SEL. Dr. Thank Friar. you. Uh Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I'm the best to comment on it, but I'll just mention very briefly that you mentioned discipline practices that have been disproportionately punitive towards children of color. Uh, but discipline practices, again, this is back to the earlier question, that have been not so successful for any kid. We put too many kids out of school. We, we, you know, we suspend kindergartners. I mean, these are not good strategies for promoting development. So we've got things, we, we, strategies we call restorative practices. Some people don't like them as much as others because they think they're too lenient. But we can, we can create discipline strategies that are not designed to segregate and eliminate children from the system, but rather to keep them in the system and help them heal. Thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you for the indulgence. I do hope to get a second uh, reading opportunity here because I wanna explore this beyond just the issue of discipline. So yeah. thank you, thank you, Dr. Shriver. I thank you, back. thank you very much. Uh, uh, Congressman Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank our witnesses for being with us and, and for the interesting conversations that we've had. I've, I've learned a lot as well. Uh, and I want to so, you know, reflect the comments of, of Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Uh, I found it really interesting. I'm learning a lot. I don't know a lot. And that is why members of Congress uh, are probably in the uh, least appropriate place to be making decisions about the allocation of hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars for educational purposes. Uh, I was in the state of Virginia House of Delegates for 16 years, and we were uh, much more involved in making educational decisions uh, about the content, about the standards of learning in our schools, about the standards of quality in Virginia schools, but recognizing that much of what was taught and much of what was uh, decided was best left to uh, the local level, to local school boards, and to parents, ultimately, as they make the decisions. As I was in the State House for 16 years, I remember when No Child Left Behind was passed, and the uh, negative reaction not just on the part of state legislators at the infringement over uh, the prerogatives of states to decide uh, how best children should learn in their states, but, but with parents who were upset about uh, teaching of, of common core and, and uh, different concepts that were being pushed down on localities and on parents by an overarching federal education bureaucracy being run out of Washington, D.C., and so uh, I, I associate myself with the comments of many of my colleagues on, on my side who, who are questioning the role of the federal government in this process. Um, and, and quite frankly, um, I, I'm falling back on my old Ronald Reagan line, here we go again, uh, because this is a perfect example of what happens when the Washington bureaucracy creates a means by which you can hijack local instruction and use it to push overtly political, social and emotional engineering down on students on a national level. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask Mr. Eden, uh, at the very least, with this radical ideology being taught more regularly in schools, do you believe that if there's more transparency and if these topics are being discussed, that parents can be made aware of what's being taught and should be made aware of what's being taught in their child's school? I think I think they they can should and must right I mean structurally what SEL can do uh, is come down as a mandate that you kind of fill these categories of instruction ways of approaching children that could be filled with unobjectionable positive things or could be filled with things that many parents would object to 
Uh, and parents have a right to kind of know what's coming in. If it's objectionable, they should be able to speak from an informed perspective to what they object to. Uh, and if it's not, they should be put at ease that, hey, actually in my district, SEL doesn't involve these things. SEL is still kind of what it primarily involved five to 10 years ago. Uh, but parents can't know that unless they know that. And that and kind of local government doesn't work unless parents know what's going on in their schools. Well, I know that in one county in Virginia, Loudoun County, they, re they were requiring parents to sign non-disclosure agreements before they could review curriculum in those Loudoun County schools. And there has been an earthquake in Virginia politics over the last year, and it has been centered around parental rights. Uh, our new governor, Glenn Youngkin, has put that at the forefront of his administration and is pushing for more transparency in our schools. Um, I would look to Ohio, where they have a Parents' Right to Know Act that provides for full parental curricular review and opt in by the parents, not opt out. And so uh, I think there are opportunities there, but they should be taken at the state level. They shouldn't be uh, mandated at the federal level, uh, unless you're talking about openness and uh, making sure that parents are ultimately the ones who have the control, who have the responsibility, and, and not, uh, again, a bureaucracy from DC pushing uh, a certain uh, mandates down on localities. Mr. Eden, can you speak to how social and emotional learning may infringe on the privacy of students and families? Yeah, I mean, the, the story that you gave from Loudoun County, if I recall correctly, was about access to a school survey, um, in addition to curriculum, uh, what questions are kids being asked? Um, qu asking questions is not an inherently neutral act. What is being done with the questions that is being asked might not be neutral. Uh, it, when you ask students very personal questions to find out things in order to affect them, that's an invasion of privacy, technically. Uh, and I think there's a role the federal government could play in shoring up parental notification, kind of shoring up the Pupils Protections Rights Act so that parents uh, don't have a situation where they don't know what their kids are being asked and don't know what's being done with what they're being asked. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, th thank you, and I would hope at some point our other uh, witnesses will get an opportunity to speak to uh, the issue of uh, what is being done at the local level in a variety of states, which is under their own, you know, uh, uh, a jurisdiction and the efforts that are being made that is not a federal mandate. Uh, let me Madam. recognize uh, Congressman, um, I, I have to move on to recognize Congressman Bustos, but we'll get to your point. Uh, Congressman Bustos. Thank you very much, uh, Chair DeLauro, and, and thanks for holding this, this hearing today. And I'm going to get hyper-local here, okay? Um, so, uh, Dr. Darling Hammond, I'm going to address my first question to you, but let me have a little bit of a lead-in, okay? Um, I, I've held a series of economic roundtables throughout the district that I serve in central and northwestern Illinois. I've done this for a number of years. And... Um, the more recent ones, you know what I heard about at every single one of them? It was about teacher shortages, okay? Hyper, hyper local here. So uh, so what I did, I, then I, I made a decision to bring together teachers, teachers' aides, administrators, so we could drill down and have a deeper conversation on this issue. And you know what came up at every single one of them at the local level? Social, emotional learning, all right? So there you go, it's local. Um, so, but part of it, I'm going to drill down then even further about teachers specifically. Um, you know what happens when we don't pay teachers enough or if we don't provide a supportive environment, um, people don't become teachers or if they do become teachers and we're not supportive, um, or they're overworked and underpaid, they leave. And when they leave, we're losing staff numbers and we're losing this experience. And that all takes a, a toll on our kids. So again, drilling down further, that takes a toll on our kids. So our, our schools really, as I see it, aren't equipped to provide uh, the, our, our students the whole learning environment that they need. And as a result, students suffer. Um, so you know, teacher shortages were worsening pre-pandemic. We knew that, we've all seen that. And they've been made even worse by the pandemic. Uh, so again, uh, Dr. Darling Hammond, um, can you please talk about the measurable impact of teacher shortages 
on the academic, social, and emotional development of children and touch on how the pandemic has affected these issues as well. Well, uh, we know that uh, teacher shortages result in several things. Uh, they result in uh, courses getting canceled. They result in larger class sizes because you can't hire enough teachers, or they result in people being hired into the classroom who don't have training to teach. And that happens at a large level. It happens disproportionately in higher need settings. But I will say, for example, in California, about half the people coming into teaching in the last few years have been coming in without preparation. And that means that they're coming in not knowing how to teach math and science and reading. It also means that they don't have the tools to understand child development. Uh, and quite often, the disproportionate uh, disciplinary actions and uh, problems like managing a classroom also bubble up. So children are underserved when there are teacher shortages in substantial ways. Um, and just to kind of loop it back around to the questions we've been talking about, uh, one of the things that we need to keep teachers in the classroom and to give them that support is the set of wraparound supports that community schools and other whole child education strategies can offer, uh, which a number of districts and states are looking into and the Congress has begun to support uh, when you have health and mental health services there in the school, when you have the social services to help kids, then teachers can create a much more uh, positive environment and they can help kids get what they need. Teachers burn out also when they can't help kids, when they can't meet all of the needs that they see their students presenting because they want, that's why they're there. And uh, if we wrap around the teachers and the students, with these kinds of supports, you'll see uh, a much better result with respect to teacher uh, retention uh, and student learning. Very good, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to squeeze in a, a last question here in the last minute. Dr. Cantor and Dr. Stryber, if we have time for this, um, this will be addressed to you. Uh, we've seen the siloed approach to addressing certain elements of childhood development. Um, so the whole child approach obviously is important towards breaking down these silos. Um, you know, with developing children's physical, mental, social support all together, we're able to create a, a more supportive learning environment and, and be able to address these social disparities that we've talked about today. Um, but the approach of, of breaking down the silos and addressing disparities is, is really, uh, we see it as, as central to addressing social determinants of health. And I know Chair Deloro knew I would try to squeeze this in. She's been incredibly supportive as has ranking member Cole in a, a bill that I have that uh, called the Social Determinants Accelerator Act. Um, we've got grants in that that look to empower communities to tailor their approach to addressing these local disparities, local disparities, uh, which may include better uh, incorporating educational initiatives like the Whole Child Program. Um, I, I'm out of time now. I guess I, I plugged my Social Determinants Accelerator Act um, and I, I guess I just want to make sure that our, our panelists know about this and um, we'll, have to, we'll have to talk about this offline at another time. Um, thank you, Chair DeLauro, for all of your support of such an important measure and thanks for holding the hearing today. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, is Congresswoman Lee on? Okay, I, get, I, I, I guess not. And then what we'll do is to move to a second round and I don't know, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Bustos, and thank you for getting in the social determinants. I knew I knew you would, but I'd also like to have people respond to it, et cetera, because these are uh, really experts in the uh, in, in, in the field. Let me. Um, um, I think Mr. Cole has has um, uh, had to go to the rules committee. So um, let let me ask about community schools. This is an issue that I've, I've you know uh, uh, have some familiarity with. It, we had one of the first in the nation in, in New Haven, uh, the, the Dr. Harry Conti Community School, which I spent a lot of time uh, working at and volunteering, really volunteering, you know, at, at time there. So, and I want to ask you, Dr. Cantor, Dr. Uh, Darling Hammond and Dr. Shriver, uh, I want to ask you the question about how the community school model can play a role in, in really disrupting the effects of poverty uh, so that our most vulnerable kids can learn and they can thrive. And the, if you will, what you talk about, Dr. Cantor, is the positive environments in which kids can thrive in community schools in this uh, in this space. So, let me ask you 
the three of you to respond. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. I'm actually on the current task force for community schools and in this next generation. First, it emphasizes the point that Congresswoman Bustos just mentioned, and that is that health and mental health and well being are essential determinants about kids and their ability to learn in school. And we've known this forever. And in the first generation of community schools, the big focus was access, have the services in school and have those services easily available to parents, particularly parents who work, and to take the stigma out of many of those services, particularly mental health services. But now community schools is doing something more. Okay, I spoke about whole child learning and the fact that integrated supports are an essential component of the five components of whole child learning. So the new focus of community schools is actually to connect the activities in support of kids, whether they are health and mental health and learning, engagement and learning in enhancing motivation, enhancing energy and putting kids into a position where they can feel the full power of their capacities to learn and engage. So the new generation of community schools is not even just about supports. It's about supports in service to powerful learning for each and every child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Darlingham. I'll just piggyback on that. I'll just say California has just invested almost $3 billion in getting community schools launched in our highest poverty schools. Uh, and uh, about a third of our schools have more than 80% of students who live in poverty. And what does that mean? It means to us that in these schools, we will have health clinics and mental health supports and uh, mental health professionals. Uh, the health clinics will be sure that kids uh, get uh, the kind of healthcare that many of them don't get, that they get vision testing and you know, hearing testing and all of the other supports. But it will also mean that they get expanded learning time, that there'll be tutoring after school, that there'll be support for after school um, homework, uh, for um, mentoring and a variety of other uh, recreation and enrichment uh, activities for students. It will mean that they will be able to uh, get support from social service providers. If you know, a family is about to be evicted, we have a, lot, a high homelessness rate all across the country for children, but uh, certainly in, in my state. Uh, and the facilities to help families in those regards will be there. All of these things remove obstacles to learning. Uh, and then we need inside the school for teachers to have enough knowledge base about how to recognize the needs that children have, to connect them to those services that will be readily available. And uh, that can be transformative for the teaching and learning process and for the retention of teachers, as I mentioned. Dr. Schreiber, I'm gonna go over my time. So I want you to have the opportunity to talk about community schools because I think we have similar experiences. Yeah. Well, having also worked at Conti School, uh, Congressman Laura, I, I, I think we know, uh, again, I think there's not a really controversial issue here. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion on this hearing about federal versus local. Uh, this is a movement that started as a local movement. It, it's not a top-down movement. I mean, I don't want to disillusion members of Congress, but this is a movement that has been built by parents and teachers and educators for the last 30, 40 years by communities that wanted to add tutorial services, that wanted to support. So I think we have like more, much more agreement here than we realize. Parental engagement, absolutely. The, the picture again behind me, Dr. Comer, first pillar of this work is parental engagement. You, I, I, I would agree with all the members of this committee and all the, all the witnesses in saying that parents are actually completely critical and need to be in community schools and need to be valued and, 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 and listened to and disclosed to in community schools. The resources that children need are at the community level. They're not at the federal level. So, I mean, maybe there's a specter of a federal takeover, but let me count me as the person not in favor of it. I'm completely in favor of empowering parents and local communities to be uh, at the center of all this work. So I'll stop there. Well, I, I, before we uh, uh, go on, let me just um, um, mention this, uh, uh, to just piggyback on what you've said, uh, Dr. Shriver. Uh, it was, I'm just trying to think of, it's in the, in the, in the 60s um, uh, at the Dr. Harry Conti Community School. 
Um, and uh, I had just finished a graduate degree at Columbia University. It may have been 1965, 1966. And I didn't have a job. So I went to volunteer my time at the Conti School, which is a community school. And by the way, the initiation of community school in that concept came from a Dr. Ger uh, Gerald Tarazi, who wrote a, his doctoral dissertation in Ann Arbor about the role of community schools and locally what community schools could mean. Uh, that school was open from six o'clock in the morning until nine or 10 o'clock at night. Everyone was in the school, mothers, fathers, grandparents. There were sports uh, 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 with, with, with older kids, tutorial services, health services, the whole nine yards and the, and the benefits from the, it, it, it was really, it was, it, it's extraordinary. All locally based. No one was the, uh, dictating what was taught, what extracurricular activities were, um, uh, what the after school programs were, et cetera. It was all based on, 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 on local efforts. A, 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 it was almost, well, we, we really went backwards in terms of education uh, when we stopped dealing with community schools, which is why I will, you, you know, that we are now moving to looking to the future with community, understand the word community schools and their ability uh, to help to make and create a positive a positive environment uh, for children and for families and for parents and for parents to engage not with their kids and with one another and to be able to create that overall positive relationship um, there. And I'm going to, uh, 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 Congressman Harris, uh, Congresswoman Lee is here. I'm going to give her, her, her I was going to recognize Congressman Lee uh, uh, I tried to get her into the first round, but then we will move forward, uh, Dr. Harris. So Congresswoman Barbara Lee. You're on mute. You're on mute. Barbara, you're on mute. Yeah, I apologize for being late, but I was chairing my own subcommittee. So I'm so glad to be able to just be with you for a few minutes. And I wanna thank all of our witnesses. This is such an important, uh, important uh, meeting, hearing on, to really <laughs> secure the future <laughs> for, our young people uh, in the country. And I wanted to just, and I, forgive me if this is a redundant question uh, on trauma, just wanted to find out uh, how the schools, um, how you see the trauma that many of our young people now are experiencing as a result of say gun violence in many of our communities, as a result of being unsheltered, as a result of COVID, uh, all of the uh, trauma of just living um, in many communities, living poor, living living as a black person, as a black brown person, brown, black and brown children. And also uh, how can social, my background is psychiatric social work. And so I've always wanted more uh, social workers and psychologists uh, in our schools uh, and defining their roles so that they are servicing schools and school districts uh, and with teacher turnover so high and staff changing, wanted to find out how the federal government uh, what do you think the federal government should do to intervene to make sure that we sustain uh, levels of, of training that uh, we need in our, in our schools, as well as what we can do to address trauma-related um, factors that children now are experiencing? The trauma is my specialty. This is, this is the work that I've dedicated my life to um, as a mental health professional. But we have, we have a lot, a lot of kids that have been impacted by the pandemic. So we can't say to ourselves that the solution is every child will have a therapist because that's unlikely to be something that we can provide. But one of the things that we can provide is for all of the environments, whether they are schools or community-based organizations, after school or programs. The whole principle of whole child design is that every single environment in which children grow and learn can be set up to address the things that trauma does to kids. Trauma is about stress and stress's effect 
on the brain and on learning and on kids' emotional development. You have kids walking into environments every day that are going to be healing places, places that reduce stress, places that provide relationships, and places that connect kids to sources of support. That, that is the response that's required today because of the impact, the traumatic impact of the pandemic on development and learning. And, and let me ask you, uh, I have a couple of minutes left, uh, anyone who could answer this question, in terms of any federal guidelines that provide uh, guidelines for expulsions and, and disciplinary action. Uh, I, for many years when I was in the legislature, tried to tighten up the California code uh, to have some criteria for expulsions, especially of, of black and brown young kids like in kindergarten uh, and never could get that done for a lot of reasons. And so I'm wondering, uh, do we have now guidelines that, because uh, we want alternatives to suspension and disciplinary uh, actions that would allow, that would force kids out of school. So what are the federal guidelines or are, are there any federal initiatives that would make sure that kids have alternatives uh, and the expulsions uh, have some kind of criteria if the kid's gonna be expelled, expelled, it's gonna be for the right reason, which I can't for the life of me determine what the right reason would be to expel us. Yeah, or I'd love to, love to speak to that from both the California and federal perspective. The Department of Education is right now uh, revising and getting ready to issue guidelines uh, on uh, disciplinary um, actions and disparities and uh, how the, how they will be involved in uh, uh, investigating uh, disparities uh, as well as uh, guidelines for restorative practices that involve kids in you know community circles and in supports that teach them conflict resolution and a variety of things in California. Uh, the zero tolerance policies that were in place have been eliminated. Uh, the use of suspension and expulsions for things like um, uh, sort of discretionary um, behaviors like, you know, uh, willful defiance is the- Yeah, label. like wear hair like I wear have, my hair. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> have, have, been, have been eliminated. Um, the state now looks at exclusionary discipline in its accountability system. Uh, we've got uh, uh, licensing standards that require teachers and principals to learn strategies that work to support children in learning behavior and you know, staying in school. So there's a lot that uh, both the federal guidance uh, can do in this regard uh, and that states can be picking up and can be encouraged to pick up as ways to keep kids in schools. We see higher graduation rates. We see a stronger achievement as a result of those kinds of actions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're on mute. Thank you, Madam Chair. Got it. Now you're okay, not Dr. Muted. Harris, go for it. <laughs> Thank you very, very Thank much. You. And uh, so, uh, and, and Ms. Reed, I want to follow up with you uh, because, you know, if you read, uh, you know, if you go to Castle's website and you read about things, you know, and I'm going to read from it, it says Castle is refining a specific form of SEL implementation that concentrates SEL practice on transforming in inequitable settings and systems and promoting justice oriented civic engagement, which we are calling transformative SEL. So, SEL is, is being changed. So is there any academic evidence that transformative SEL, this new kind of SEL, actually improves academic performance? Because I mean, that, that's hopefully what the school system is all about because you know families can do a lot of social emotional uh, learning and teaching. Schools have to concentrate on academic performance. Is there any evidence that transformative SEL improves academic performance in, well, a, in a highly uh, rated study? Yeah, well, before before answering that question, I kind of would like to pose a question, which is that, you know, if, if we know that SEL works from all these studies that we say that, you know, prove that it works, well, why transform it? <laughs> um, as for, you know, what we know about the outcomes of transformative SEL, given that it's based in a paper that was written in 2019 or 2018, I believe, and then adopted within about a year by the organization, and it takes a totally different moral, political, ideological uh, spin to the enterprise, 
uh, it would I would be shocked to find that there are studies, uh, short term or long term, about SEL as it is now defined. Sure, and and that's totally totally understandable because it's it's brand new. And I I imagine your question was rhetorical because I think we know why. It's because we want to change this into a into because CRT is no longer very popular to use. People shy away from it. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Shriver, I'm glad to hear that, that you don't want a top-down involvement uh, because what we learned from COVID, and there are very few silver linings, is that parents finally figured out what's being taught in their schools, and they didn't like it. Uh, I, parental involvement is absolutely essential, but they didn't like what they were seeing in the schools. Then they were told, then they, when they tried to get information, they had to sign, as the gentleman from Virginia said, non-disclosure agreements to, to look at curriculum, uh, something that should never, ever occur in, a, in, a, in, a, in our public school system, but it's going on. Uh, anyway, so Mr. Eden, let me uh, talk a little bit because I want to follow up on what uh, my colleague from Washington State asked about, which is this idea that uh, you're, you kind of are turning teachers into therapists a little bit. Uh, yes, look, there are mental health issues. I get it. You know, I'm a physician. Uh, to actually deal with mental health issues, you know, we have complete residencies that take years and years. Teachers are not equipped to do this, and yet they may be asked to do it. And you suggest that uh, things could go horribly wrong in a variety of ways. Um, how? Why do you say that? I mean, I, yeah, I believe that's probably true when you have under trained individuals delving into very, very serious issues. Why do you, why do you say that things go horribly wrong? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go straight to the, you know, the scariest thing that, that, that scares me, uh, which is uh, the implementation of suicide awareness and prevention programs, right? Now, I, to my knowledge, I haven't looked into it deeply. I, I believe that it's possible to implement these programs well, would stand to reason that it would be. Uh, but also there's a risk that that could go terribly wrong because uh, you might normalize the thought of suicide if you ask students repeatedly year after year, possibly semester after semester in surveys or in interventions, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? You risk normalizing those thoughts. Um, you risk potentially increasing the overall number of suicides in an effort to address it. Uh, the scariest thing for me is if that happens, uh, will the system double down on the intervention that might be engendering it? Will it say, oh, wow, we have this increase in student tragedies. Let's double down on suicide prevention and awareness. I mean, that's that's the, the worst thing that can happen. But other things is, you know, when students are kind of asking questions about who they are, uh, those are questions maybe best left to a therapist or to a psychiatrist when it reaches levels of kind of gender dysphoria, reaches levels of extreme stress. Those are things that teachers just aren't trained and really can't be effectively trained with anything except for pop psychology, which frequently you know, carries an ideological valence to it, uh, even if it's not intended to. Um, you can feed all sorts of counterproductive, not, uh, you know, not good thoughts into students while you're trying to help them. Yeah, it's, it's the cart before the horse. I mean, we can agree that that might be important, but then we have to educate our educators to actually be therapists uh, finally, just one last thing is, uh, the, you know, the privacy issue, a huge issue. Again, this was in uh, the state of Maryland where they were uh, passing around these surveys and specifically not releasing the surveys to, to parents, the questions on the surveys. V very disturbing when it's dealing with early elementary school children. Uh, anyway, I yield back, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. If I, if I might, since uh, 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 Castle was referenced and Dr. Shriver, you are uh, uh, and the board, uh, chairman of the board of Castle, I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, to respond to the uh, issue of, uh, of Thanks, transformative. Congressman. Thank SEO. you, Congressman Harris. Yeah, thank you. So um, I appreciate the concern about transformative SEL. It, it, it was a paper written, and as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Eaton, it suggests that there are uh, forms of SEL for certain districts where local communities are particularly interested in the issues that you described. It is not a reform of the basic science. It is a paper that describes ways to integrate certain strategies when communities are interested in that form of SEL. It has become very uh, popular in many districts. It, it is not inflammatory. I'm, I, I, you know, maybe some of the language sounds to some people that it's uh, triggering or in some ways of concern, but 
it's been very well received as a form. Again, I just want to point out, all of these decisions are made at the local level. Uh, Castle is not uh, imposed, Castle doesn't have a curriculum. Uh, Castle reviews and evaluates and creates knowledge and learning systems for teachers and superintendents and parents and others who want to look at curriculum and want to decide on what works in their community. Uh, but Castle is not telling people what to teach. It's giving people guidelines about where the evidence is, as good as the evidence is and where the evidence isn't. So we're trying to create an open forum here that inspires people to experiment and challenge and try things that studies that you refer to as not being about transformative SEL are not about transformative SEL. They're about other forms of SEL where, the study, where you can look at the curricula that were in the meta-analyses and those are the ones that are being evaluated. There's no secrets here. It's really, uh, I mean, at, at some level, and I think Dr. Harris, you know, your point about the, the comparison to medicine, I think is really important. My mentor, Dr. Dr. James Comer always used to say that, you know, in medicine, every doctor has a basic science, it, it, human anatomy. Uh, in education, we need a basic science. Uh, which is child development. It, it, it's not to say that you know in all moments how to apply the science. It's just to say we need the, the basic understanding of human development as educators in order to be able to teach math and science and reading and so on better. Uh, so what we're trying to do is underpin uh, the, the field, if you will, the profession. Teachers should not be therapists. Absolutely less than one. I mean, I learned this again 30 years ago. When problems arise and there aren't, they're in the classroom already. I mean, we can hope that these problems aren't in the classroom, but they're there. What we have tried to enforce and in, 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 emphasize to teachers is when problems surface, make sure you have the capacity to recognize them and refer the children out. Help the children to recognize what we call help seeking skills. When I was a kid, when I was in trouble, I had no skills to look for help. I didn't know how, I was embarrassed, I was ashamed. If I was lonely, if I was angry, if I was confused, if my peers were using drugs. Uh, what we try to do in these programs is help children recognize when they need help. We call it help seeking skills. And we try to help teachers realize when children need help, how to refer them out. We call it multi-tiered systems of support. Classrooms are not therapeutic settings. Uh, but they can be very powerful settings for supporting development across array of local environments. Congresswoman Franklin. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Okay, so I have with me a calculator. Now, if I ask this calculator, I don't ask it, but if I put in what is two plus two, it tells me four. It's uneventful. If I ask my grandchild that, Depending upon his mood, I might get an answer. So I just said, a lot of this is just common sense. Of course, a child's emotional development is important to his education, his well-being, and to everybody else. Uh, that is not to say, and, and look, I believe that parents are the most important part of a children's life, or can be, or should be, unfortunately, some children don't have, are not blessed with the love and nurturing of, of parents. But the fact of the matter is, I was look, I just looked this up. The average child just spends between three to six hours a day in school, depending upon the age. So by the time they're done with school, it's over 14,000 hours. Hello, these children are not robots. We better be pay attention to all aspects of their life. And so, you know, I'm not, I don't want to go rant and rave all day about my horrifying, embarrassing law in, in Florida uh, that don't say gay. I'm, I, 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 okay, I'm going to go past that because we are mourning, we are still mourning in Florida, the carnage at Parkland, uh, the trials going on this week, 17 ch children and teachers killed, 17 more injured, and it, and not to make an excuse for the killer, uh, but it appears from his background that he was very, that he was bullied, uh, that he had a lot of what I would say emotional problems. That's not an excuse, but it would have been nice if there had been some intervention because it would have, it may have saved so many lives. Uh, and that's what I really wanted to ask uh, 
I'm going to I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Cantor. Uh, if you could just explain how this type of uh, by by recognizing the child's emotional development, how can this help? You know, at least point out to the powers that be that there may be a trouble a, a child in trouble. So one of the things that um, that Tim Shriver said a minute ago around this idea of what is knowledge that we have and what is basic science. So one really crucial element of basic science is the impact of stress on development and learning. All of us, when we experience stress, have a biologic reaction to it that's mediated by a hormone a hormone that travels to the brain and can create that fight flight feeling. When kids are bullied, <clears throat> when kids are othered, when they don't feel safe in the environment in which they go to school, these stress mechanisms are set off and they will impact how a child behaves, whether they can concentrate and learn and whether they are going to be able to thrive in a setting. Now this is knowledge, this is not theory. I learned it in the eighties in med school. Okay, so there's no, nothing about this that is new. I also learned that the most powerful force that can mitigate, okay, that can address this feeling of stress is another hormone that is released because of positive relationships that kids have. That hormone is oxytocin. So in our body, we have one that raises stress and one that takes it away. So what do we know that releases that helpful hormone that helps kids learn and helps them feel safe? Okay, it's, an, it's environments in which they feel safe, have positive relationships, know that they belong, you are actually impacting the biology of a child and making that child able to learn and thrive. Okay, yeah. this is not theory. This is knowledge. Um, Ms. Ms. Frankel, you if you don't- Can I, I yield back? Oh, I'm sorry, did you? I, yeah, a quick, just a, a quick comment, because I-, no, I Sir, I, sir, I'm, sir. No, no comment. I'm out of time. Um, back. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. I thank you, Dr. Cantor. Um, That's very interesting discussion. Um, so we know that we've had all these problems in the schools anyway. You know, the bullying, the the racism, the homophobic homophobic behavior, even at a very young age. Now we have kids coming back to school from the pandemic, from the isolation, from the insecurities that they experience at home. I even have concern about uh, children who've lost their caretaker, their provider during this pandemic. And now we're bringing them back into what we consider to be their normal routine of going to school. What are some of the things that we need to be looking at and doing and are we doing to address the kind of um, sort of emotional condition that a child is coming back to school? I think that the, the work on whole child learning, this, this was a collaboration where we sought Linda Darling Hammond and I and a, and a team of scientists to answer the question, what do we know from the science of learning and development that says, how should a learning environment be designed so that children walking in the door are going to experience the conditions that optimally sort, support their ability to engage and perform in school. So those five factors in whole child design, relationships, belonging, rich instruction, supports, and building 21st century skills, all of that came directly out of the science of learning and development and pointed the way toward the design of these comprehensive environments. We now have a playbook that can help districts implement 
toward that kind of comprehensive design. We have to stop binary solutions. We have to stop siloed solutions. You can't do whole child design with your left hand and have harsh exclusionary discipline with your right hand. Okay, these things are antithetical to each other. And we need to build holistic design in which we solve many problems at the same time for kids. Thank you. Um, Ms. Darlingham, and could you just quickly address where are we in our, um, in schools having access to this sort of learning paradigm and um, their readiness and willingness to engage in this approach to educating and addressing the needs of our children. Yeah, and I, I think that um, where we started uh, in the beginning of the hearing around the social emotional learning programs that have been developed and vetted uh, and are accessible to schools is, is a part of that. About a third of the districts that have uh, used the American Rescue Plan Act money and the ESSER funding have used it to put in place uh, these kinds of supports that enable teachers to ask, help students process their emotions, talk about their experiences, learn coping strategies that allow them to uh, you know, work through some of what they've experienced, the community schools component of it, which again, many districts are using those funds for, um, are also accessing the mental health professionals and supports that then uh, can help students deal with the trauma that they've experienced. Um, but there's a lot of effort going in and, and the federal funding has been extremely valuable for this uh, to uh, help schools create this kind of a whole child design uh, in the curriculum and in the support systems around them. There's more to be done to be sure, but we do see uh, much better outcomes uh, in the places that are putting those supports in place uh, for students so that they can recalibrate and feel that the school is a welcoming place where they can get the necessary supports yeah. that they can't Thank get otherwise. Thank you. Can I say that I, I'm so supportive of the community school um, uh, design? I believe that if we could co-locate services, not only for students, but for even families. I mean, yes. I had a visionary governor uh, uh, um, who believed decades ago that we could have health care there, we could have job um, seeking there, we could have housing seeking there. I also believe very much that we could keep children in school doing both academic and athletic and, and, and social involvement after the traditional school hour, keep them off the streets. I mean, it's just yeah. so much that we are not doing that we should be doing in public education. So I love hearing this. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for this opportunity. And I just look forward Okay. All right. Um, uh, let me let me just a couple of points, and then I will talk to. I, I'm assuming, uh, Dr. Harris, that in the absence of Mr. Cole, uh, I will yield to you for, for for closing remarks. But I wanted to uh, to make a couple of points, and and Ms. Reedon, I, I I appreciate really very very much appreciate your concern about low quality SEL investments, which is why with the committees with the grants that we have dealt with, they're included in what is a rigorous tiered evidence program, the education, innovation, uh, and research. So to, to, to do you know, whatever we can to make sure that the quality of the programs is uh, as intended, you know, and, and not, uh, I, I would just say about mental health issues, I would overall love to have an overwhelming um, uh, uh, support uh, on both sides of the aisle. I believe we ought to have a mental health professional in every one of our schools. That would be a goal to have, a, you know, a, a trained mental health professionals. It's one of the things we do do uh, in, in um, most recently in the, in the labor age bill is to, uh, is to include uh, funding for mental health professionals. But, but I think particularly given what's happened with the pandemic uh, and the aftermath of that, uh, I think it would be in a real investment uh, in um, uh, a serious investment in how we would like to see our children be able to uh, get past the uh, 
uh, the absolute tragedy of the last of the last couple of years and to put mental health professionals in every single school. And yes, and that is something that we ought to fund to be able to do the, uh, 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 it, it would serve us well. A last point before I recognize Mr. Harris is that um, uh, uh, this is the issue of, of the, the, the local efforts and, uh, 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 I, I, and, and I think we're looking at uh, the creation of social and emotional learning in, in, a, it's in a nonpartisan way, it's in a, 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 a states, uh, it's in rural, urban, suburban settings. And I just would mention to you the various states that are engaged and involved. There is Georgia, uh, uh, Kansas, Kentucky, Missouri, um, uh, Oklahoma, Tennessee, uh, uh, North Carolina, North Dakota. Uh, so, uh, uh, and these are these are uh, uh, efforts that are being made that are uh, grounded in what the need is on a local basis. Uh, 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 and that, that's the genesis of this. Is at, at, at its core, it is about. Of what, 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 you know, and I, I, mean, I think about this issue of, 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 of parents and school boards. As far as I know, and I, I started to look into this, uh, local school boards are parents. The local school boards all over the country include parents and who have a vested interest, obviously, in what happens to their kids and have input into what is happening to their kids. Now, let me recognize. Uh, uh, Dr. Harris uh, for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And look, I want to thank all the panelists for your interest in uh, making sure that our children get educated. That's the bottom line. That's incredibly important because I think as someone had pointed out, that is the future. I mean, our children are the future. I'm a grandfather of 10, father of six. Oh, Clearly, I, have, I am very concerned uh, with, with our ability to educate the next generation. Uh, look, I'm going to concur with the chair. We're probably not going to agree on how to fund the mental health professional in every school because I think, I think that's a state and local responsibility, but we should urge that to occur. Because unfortunately, over the past several decades, uh, the schools have come to replace the families as places where social, emotional, moral uh, learning and teaching goes on. Now, look, that's the, that's the hand of cards we're dealt. Uh, we could try to Put the family back in charge of some of that but uh, again that, that may or may not be able to occur and until that happens we have to recognize that this now is, and it is different from 50 years ago and 60 years ago that schools are going to have to take up some of this uh, i had urge us not put don't put the cart before the horse we should do some rigorous uh, research see what works what doesn't and then train the next generation of educators to that because i'm afraid a lot of the educators you know uh, it, 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 it's hard to teach an, an old dog new tricks. And a lot of educators, I think, look at some of this and say, this is, you know, this is not what I was trained to do. And they're probably right. Uh, so uh, it's, it's important to look at uh, as long as we keep our eye on the same goal, which is to make sure that our children uh, get educated, that, that their academic performance, their social, their ability to fit in socially uh, is achievable within our society. Uh, you know, that's our goal. So I, you know, I appreciate, Madam Chair, I appreciate uh, bringing together the panel. Uh, always appreciate when you bring back together panels of people who are interested in just improving the lives of our children and how our children turn out. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all. And I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And just in, 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 in closing, I, I want to uh, end where I began uh, with the Neil Postman quote, children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. They are literally the legacy we leave behind us. And uh, you know that everything we do needs to be making sure uh, that uh, uh, whether it's parents or educators, we need to make sure that our kids can meet the challenges of the future. Uh, so it is incumbent on all of us, especially legislators, to ensure that they are prepared. And that is not only intellectually, that is emotionally and socially as, as, as well. And I just might add, you know, I hear a lot about, about research and more evidence. Well, there is substantial, substantial evidence behind. It's scientific. We're standing on very solid scientific ground here uh, that the interventions, uh, 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 the science behind the interventions is overwhelming. And that high quality uh, SEL programs uh, that support uh, uh, the, these, these efforts result in absolutely positive and academic life outcomes. And it is about the future. 
of, of our children, and particularly now of the stress um, and the hardship of our most vulnerable kids uh, that they have faced in, in, in this pandemic. And I was interested in Congresswoman Watson Coleman, and, and I don't have the number at my fingertips, but the number of children who have lost their parents to COVID. You know, what is happening to these children and what are we doing uh, to, uh, 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 you know, to address this issue? So we're looking at the strategies that are uh, effective strategies, as we know, that are needed now um, more than, uh, not now more than, than ever. Uh, and, and which is why um, what we try to do uh, is to engage through the Labor uh, 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 Health and Human Services and Education Subcommittee um, uh, in addressing these issues uh, and based on the science. Because, you know, we can look at study after study after study, you know, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we know and we have study after study telling us about how children learn, at what age they're learning, et cetera. You know, it's now for us to put into practice the information that we know and to act on it. That is a moral obligation that we have in this effort. I just want to say a thank you uh, to our witnesses today. I wanted to thank you uh, for uh, not only for your testimony today, but I want to talk to say for the years and years in your professional lives of devoting this to looking at the science, developing, helping to develop the science, taking you know the interest to understand how we need to, the most significant impact we can make on children is what their is their education and where those educational opportunities will lead them. Uh, and it is uh, just so critically important. It is probably the, the, the most where we should have the greatest federal involvement in supporting what local government is doing and what the research tells us are the ways in which we can transform the lives of, of our kids uh, through education and making them feel that they have the environment, the cognitive ability, they have the social skills to be able to succeed. And thank you for devoting your lives to making that happen. And with that, I am going to Thank you very, very, very much for your testimony this morning. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.